Hello, everybody. Welcome to IVF Worldwide Webinar today. Uh, we have today, and we are honored to host, uh, Professor Christian Egerter, who was graduated at the University of Innsbruck in 1981 and completed his gynecological residency at the Medical University in Vienna in 1988. Since 2011, he is the head of the Department of Gynecological Endocrinology and Reproductive Medicine at the Medical University of Vienna. Professor Egerte published more than 270 papers in national and international journals. His research efforts have earned him several national and international grants. The topic for his presentation today is progesterone mode of action. Please, Professor Egerte. Thank you very much, Seth. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, progesterone uh, is uh, the topic of uh, today. Progesterone uh, is a steroid hormone and the parent compound is cholesterol. Cholesterol is quite an ancient substance. Uh, it could only be built, this ring structure, when uh, oxygen tension was around 3 to 4 percent on Earth. And that is why uh, cholesterol, as well as uh, the resulting steroid hormones, are practically present in every animal species. So progesterone has a great impact uh, also in the human. And as you know, progesterone needs a receptor to work within a cell. And we have actually two main types, uh, the progesterone receptor A as well as B, both display a highly conserved DNA binding domain and a less well conserved ligand binding domain. And the only difference between the two receptors is an additional activation function 3 in the progesterone receptor B. Actually, there is also another progesterone isoform, the receptor C, that is less well described. It doesn't display a DNA binding domain and it's only present during pregnancy. So obviously, this subtype C has more a regulatory and modification uh, activity. Actually, you have to imagine a progesterone receptor as a three-dimensional structure. And upon binding to an agonist, there is a conformational change, especially this helix 12 structure is moving to a different position. And that in turn leads to uh, free areas on the surface that may further interact with so-called cofactors. So what happens when a progesterone molecule comes into the cell? It binds to the progesterone receptor upon dissociation of so-called heat shock protein 19, uh, which uh, are chaperones, and then there is dimerization and direct transfer into the nucleus to the DNA, the so-called progesterone response element. The next step is the activation of different cofactors, either co-activators or co-repressors, and the final step is the activation of the basal transcription apparatus, mainly the RNA polymerase II, and that leads to the activation of transcription of different genes. So what makes the situation more complex is that depending on the tissue you are, we have different concentrations of co-activators or co-repressors. We know to about 100 different uh, cofactors, and uh, for instance, steroid receptor co-activator 1 is abundantly present within the endometrium, whereas subtype 3 is higher concentrated in breast tissue. So, depending on the concentration of the cofactors, there might be some modifications of transcription in various tissues. And uh, to see that uh, the progesterone impact is really tremendous, uh, it uh, became clear uh, when you watch uh, the progesterone response elements uh, 
throughout the many different chromosomes, uh, as you can see here, there is a high number of uh, progesterone docking stations uh, at different uh, uh, DNA um, um, DNA uh, um, residues. So, uh, a very recent and uh, highly interesting um, animal model demonstrates uh, the huge impact of progesterone on different pathways. In this uh, slightly cruel animal model, uh, the frog uh, Xenopus levis uh, was used and when you cut off one extremity, for instance, the hind limb of this frog, and put a reactor uh, to a wearable reactor with progesterone dissolved in hydrogel um, for 24 hours, in the months to come, there is a complete restoration of this extremity, a scar-free restoration uh, involving uh, not only nerves to grow, but also bones as well as vessels. And that is due to the many different growth stimuli that progesterone uh, initiates uh, in the various pathways. So that is, in my eyes, highly interesting. But there is not only the classical pathway, the interaction of progesterone with the progesterone receptor and then the transfer uh, to the DNA, this progesterone receptor complex may also interact with different other structures, such as, for instance, tyrosine kinase receptors. And that leads to a non-genomic pathway via the MAP kinase pathway, again, initiating uh, different uh, uh, transcription factors. And finally, we also have a membrane-bound progesterone component that also leads to more rapid intracellular effects. In recent years, it also became clear that not only the classical pathway, the binding of steroids to a hormone-responsive element, and then activation of transcription is obviously important, there is also an epigenetic modification so we know that progesterone may modify DNA methylation as well as histone acetylation. Both are important uh, pathways of epigenetic modifications. And even more recently, uh, it became clear that there is also a way after transcription to modify the translation into a protein. And we know that progesterone may induce different microRNAs that are small pieces of messenger RNA that uh, interact with the messenger RNA and may lead to a partial stop or even a degradation of messenger RNA and therefore a blockage of uh, the translation into a protein. So these epigenetic modifications are especially relevant, for instance, uh, during pregnancy. We know that progesterone, which is uh, one of the most important substances to keep the uterus quiescent, uh, when binding to a progesterone receptor, uh, induces a specific transcription factor, which is called CEP1, sync finger e-box binding homeobox, uh, which is located at uh, chromosome 10. And uh, by inducing this uh, transcription factor, there is an increase in microRNAs, uh, the 200 family, and that in turn leads to a downregulation of contractile gene expression. And that is probably the mechanism why the uterus and the smooth muscle cells do not contract too much during pregnancy. But these microRNAs are also important concerning implantation. We know that messenger RNA stability is important uh, in uh, different uh, aspects, such as, for instance, inflammatory, but also apoptosis, neoangiogenesis, and cell proliferation and differentiation throughout the whole um, cycle. So we have many different uh, effects of progesterone. We have the reproductive effects, and we have effects on, for instance, the central nervous system, 
recent uh, studies have um, shown nice effects uh, concerning neuroprotection protection, uh, as well as an influence of progesterone on body temperature control. All gynecology know that, uh, gynecologists know that, and there is also an effect on respiration or pain perception. But today we focus on the reproductive effect and progesterone is essential, especially concerning the secretory transformation of the endometrium, decidualization, implantation, as well as immune modulating effects uh, that are involved uh, with uh, the uh, implantation and, uh, as shortly noticed, the contractility of the uterine muscle cells. So during a normal cycle, there is a lot of uh, change in the endometrium. In the proliferative phase, there is an increase uh, in estrogen production, leading to a strong impact on cellular proliferation and growth, as well as angiogenesis. Then there is the LH surge, and thereafter there is an increase in, in, in progesterone production, uh, leading to a perfect so-called window of implantation, which is around six to ten days after the initial LH surge. And progesterone within the secretory phase leads to a glandular secretion and the stroma decidualization as well as immunologic efforts. So in the proliferative phase, estradiol uh, is essential for endometrial cell proliferation and we have actually two different layers. We have the superficial epithelial cells and the underneath stromal cells and there is a specific estrogen dominated cytokine production in, do, in these two uh, layers. But when progesterone production is increased, different regulators are uh, induced um, there are signaling molecules that appear like Indian Hedgehog or HAND2, which is heart and neural crest derivative 2, and a specific cytokine pattern is present under the influence of progesterone that not only changes uh, the epithelial cell differentiation as well as initiates uh, stromal deciduation, but also is interacting and attracting uh, immune cells from the circulation, such as macrophages or dendritic cells, uh, and also um, the natural killer cells that are uh, present uh, within the uterus, uh, leading to uh, a receptive endometrium and successful implantation. If you watch the endometrium, the surface of the endometrium by electron microscopy, you see a huge difference between the proliferative phase where a lot of mucin is produced uh, from the superficial layer, whereas in the secretory phase, there is a complete change in picture. Here we see the so-called pinopods, uh, which are protrusions of the epithelial layer of the endometrium and are the perfect place to interact with uh, the trophoblast. So here you can see uh, this pinopod that is interacting uh, already with two different uh, trophoblast uh, cells. So the mouse model is usually a perfect model to investigate what actually happens during this uh, optimal window of implantation. There is a lot of crosstalk, not only between the embryo and the endometrium, but also between the epithelial layer as well as the underneath stromal cells. And uh, during a more estrogenized uh, situation, there is a lot of estrogenic uh, driven proliferation as well as production of this mucin uh, on the superficial um, area of the epithelium, which actually keeps microorganisms uh, or also trophoblasts at a certain distance. And that is driven also by uh, stromal uh, uh, factors such as uh, fibroblast growth factor that uh, uh, induces uh, especially the estrogen receptor. And then 
when progesterone is becoming more and more predominant, there is an increase, first of all, in progesterone receptors, and then via signaling molecules such as Indian head, Indian head hooks, uh, there is an increase in, uh, in nuclear receptor uh, factor two, family two, that in turn leads to a decrease in estrogen receptor within the epithelium, and also uh, a decrease in fibroblastic growth factor, and that uh, leads to a shift in a more progestogenic uh, situation and further on via the bone morphometric uh, protein as well as uh, wingless uh, and also hand two there is um, the initiation of the sidualization uh, right at the window of implantation when the embryo approaches uh, the um, inner surface of the endometrium so progesterone and to a less extent also uh, cyclic AMP, uh, is transforming endometriostromal cells uh, by the initiation of different factors into decidual cells. And then these cells produce decidual specific factors such as prolactin or insulin-like growth factor binding protein 1. And these decidualized cells then exert different activities that uh, are important for the implanting embryo to facilitate implantation. First of all, there is a down-regulation of radical oxygen species. There is also a loosening of the extracellular matrix uh, uh, by degrada degradation of uh, collagen. There is also an influence on natural killer cells, I come back to that in a minute, and there is an influence on neovascularization for the embryo to get access to the maternal uh, circulation. Here, the trophoblastic invasion um, uh, in a timely and gradually developing situation, first pinopods appear, then there is a lot of uh, cytokine signaling, especially the LIF factor, the leukemia inhibitory factor, is upregulated massively during the, the optimal window of implantation. There are also receptors on the outer side of the cytotrophoblast uh, uh, for interaction. And then uh, there is uh, adherence of uh, the trophoblast to the pinopods, uh, a lot more of cyto. Uh, kind and chemokine uh, production from both sides. And finally, there is the invasion of the trophoblast and uh, the end of uh, the window of implantation. So the timely and gradually um, network of uh, progesterone dependent factors is really necessary for successful implantation. And uh, uh, one of the most important trigger is the ratio between the estradiol production as well as the progesterone production, which uh, is uh, highest in that uh, window of implantation, whereas uh, the estrogen uh, production is down-regulated at least for uh, specific intervals, uh, so the implantation may not be disturbed. There's other um, important impact of progesterone concerning uh, the establishment of a successful pregnancy, and that is the impact on immunologic reactions. As you know, the fetus is actually a semi-allogenic um, tissue, and uh, there should be a protective immune modulation of the mother, and that is also triggered by progesterone, because progesterone leads to an increase in so-called asymmetric antibodies that do not display cytotoxicity or phagocytosis, and there is also an induction of blocking antibodies uh, to mask the fetal antigens. And then with progesterone, there is an induction of the so-called progesterone-induced blocking factor within the endometrium, and that leads to a shift from the more cellular to a humoral immunity, with uh, the shift from Th1 to Th2, where different cytokines are produced within uh, the endometrium. 
And finally, there is also an influence of this progesterone-induced blocking factor on the natural killer cells activity to be down-regulated to accept uh, the semi-allogenic uh, material. And that, again, can nicely be demonstrated in a mouse model that progesterone leads to decidualization, uh, which uh, uh, improves trophoblastic invasion. Then we have, uh, via epigenetic silencing mechanisms, a different uh, uh, pattern of uh, cytokines, a shift from the Th1 to the Th2 state, we have the induction of progesterone-induced blocking factor that uh, leads to immunosuppressive activities. For instance, uh, galactin is uh, increased, and we know that galactin uh, leads to an arrest of the local dendritic cells. And finally, progesterone also modulates maternal immune tolerance by, uh, for instance, increasing local recruitment and the generation of T regulatory cells. And that finally is a prerequisite uh, for a successful implantation. And finally, let me shortly address also progesterone throughout pregnancy. It's really impressive how high progesterone production uh, is induced during pregnancy. Uh, we have really highest levels at the end of pregnancy uh, in uh, the serum of the mother. And interestingly, uh, even uh, though uh, progesterone is massively leading to a down regulation of contractile properties of the smooth muscle cells, there is no decrease at the end of, um, of um, uh, pregnancy in uh, progesterone um, uh, concentration in the maternal circulation. So, progesterone, uh, which is produced uh, within the placenta in increasing amounts out of cholesterol, leads to uterine quiescence. And uh, not only the parent compound itself, <clears throat> but also, for instance, the 5 beta dehydroprogesterone is important also for down-regulating uh, contractile activity. And, of course, there are also other metabolites, such as, for instance, um, um, allopregnanolone, which uh, interacts uh, with the GABA receptor in the fetal brain that may be important. And there's the way uh, for eliminating via the 20-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone pathway. So, progesterone increases during pregnancy, and the reason why it um, leads to a relaxation of the uterine smooth muscle cell is the induction, especially of this transcription factors set one and two, that leads to an induction of microRNAs, and that in turn leads to a down-regulation of contractile associated proteins, of the master switch in inflammation, the nuclear factor kappa B, as well as prostaglandins. And uh, there is also an effect on the membrane-bound progesterone receptor component that leads to a down-regulation of intercellular calcium. Uh, so progesterone is actually a very strong calcium antagonist. And then at the end of pregnancy, due to not well understood uh, impacts, uh, probably an increase in oxygen tension and lung maturation in the fetus, there is a down-regulation of this microRNA 200 family, and that in turn leads to an increase in uh, contractile associated proteins uh, in uh, nuclear factor kappa B. So uh, the initiation of labor is sort of an inflammatory process as well as prostaglandins. So obviously at the end of pregnancy, there is sort of a functional progesterone withdrawal. So in conclusion, all the different areas I demonstrated may be potential therapeutic uh, areas for exogenous progesterone. We know that uh, different clinical studies uh, gave us very nice results concerning recurrent pregnancy loss or repeated abortion. There should also be a support of the luteal phase, especially in art cycles, because in art cycles usually 
estrogen production uh, is much higher and therefore the ratio between estrogen and naturally produced progesterone may be impaired. Also in specific risk groups there may be a benefit of uh, progesterone uh, application concerning preterm delivery and of course uh, in uh, the peri and postmenopausal period of women where there is a natural decrease in progesterone um, some of them may also benefit from progesterone um, therapeutic application. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen, for a very interesting lecture. And thank you for finding the time to be with us today in such a stressful time in Europe. But there are a few questions here, and I'll try to summarize them very shortly if you can approach each of them. Uh, one of them, uh, we know during the last few years that we can stimulate patients and get very proper eggs during the time of the luteal phase. So is there any direct uh, progesterone effect on the oocyte during the stimulation? Uh, during the stimulation, there's probably no effect uh, on the oocyte. Um, the, the, the effect of uh, progesterone is mainly um, concerning the endometrium and the successful implantation. I don't think, or at least I don't know any any um, any uh, effects uh, directly on the oocyte. As far as the implantation window, window, can you please estimate the duration that uh, this implantation window window is available for the embryo to be implanted? Usually it's uh, around three to four days, the optimum of uh, the uh, endometrial um, changes, and then it closes again. Um, however, uh, in, uh, it, 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 it's ne never um, definitely clear how long it lasts, especially in art cycles, because you have uh, sort of a, um, um, a disturbed uh, ratio between the estrogen production um, as well as uh, the addition of uh, progesterone and therefore uh, this might impact also the endometrial receptive phase. So usually in a natural cycle the window is uh, around three to four days but it may be longer or sometimes also shorter in art cycles. There is a paper published by De Ziegler years ago in which he characterized, or actually he mentioned that there is a desynchronization between the glands and the stroma, which might impair uh, the function of the endometrium and implantation of the, of the embryo. And he um, thought that the rise of progesterone, whether it's fast or slow, might interfere with the development of the endometrium. Can you comment on this, if there is a difference between uh, the development of the glands and the stroma based on the progesterone level and the way or the time it takes him to rise? Yeah, um, um, it seems quite likely that sometimes there is a synchronization between uh, different uh, uh, tissues within the endometrium, especially the glandular cells, uh, which might also be impacted uh, especially through estrogens because estrogens has a strong proliferative effect also on the glandular cells and sometimes there is a, a desynchronization uh, especially when the ratio between estrogen and progesterone uh, isn't uh, optimal and therefore this uh, uh, desynchronized uh, glandular uh, proliferation may impact also uh, the um, successful uh, implantation. Um, and, and the last question, please. Uh, there are several formulations in terms of progesterone using for the luteal phase and supporting early pregnancy. And this is the IM, the saputan, the vaginal, and the oral progesterone. Can you please comment on this? Usually I prefer natural progesterone for supplementation in uh, art cycles uh, or diadogesterone 
which uh, is actually also the same molecule and uh, just fits a little bit better into the progesterone receptor and therefore has an enhanced uh, half-life. Uh, so progesterone or didogesterone to me is probably a better option than any other synthetic hormone that has to be uh, also um, applied, for instance, intramuscularly, which is usually not uh, a very nice option for the patients. So uh, we, use, we are using either natural progesterone, uh, vaginally or orally, in higher dosages, or didogesterone, uh, where you can lower the daily dose of intake. Okay, Is that better? thank you very much. Thank you again for being with us today. And, um, thank you. And I hope that uh, Europe will, the situation in Europe will come better uh, quite soon. And thank you again. Thank you, Seth. And greetings, Bob. Bob Gleicher. Thank you. He's in okay. Austrian. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.